This is Don't Get Me Started. This is a conversation about advertising. And here is your host, freelance creative director and creative circus department head, Dan Balser. Yes, welcome back to another episode of the podcast. Um, it's been a while. Um, the last one of these that I recorded was in March, I think March 6th. Um, that Some stuff has changed since then. There have been a few changes that have happened. And years ago when I started recording these conversations, the, the intention was always to make them evergreen. There's no real shelf life on them. They kind of hold up over time. But this one is... Um, different. This one is a conversation to reflect our time. And I've been thinking about this a lot recently. So is this podcast, this episode, a diversion, a palate cleanser from the news of the world? Should it be a foot forward looking at the future, which I think has sort of always been the point of these conversations is to hear from advertising professionals about their careers so we can navigate our own. Is it an inspection of the present time. And I think it's kind of all of these, but most mostly it's a conversation that reflects where we are right now. A couple of notes I want to make before I introduce the speaker. I did mention on this conversation a Hershey's commercial. The name of that spot is My Dad, and it was produced by Arnold and Havas. And I'm sorry that when we, when we recorded this, I did not remember the agency. Of course, it was Arnold and Havas. Also, I want to mention that there are pictures of all the guests I publish. I take a picture of every guest, and I publish it when I publish the podcast. Those are all available on balserville.com, which is the homepage for the podcast, where you can also stream the show directly to your device. I have to say, I really enjoyed this conversation with Anna. Um, I really appreciate Robin Fitzgerald for suggesting Anna, and I really enjoyed our conversation. When we finished this recorded section of this. We actually stayed on the phone and talked for a good solid hour and 15 minutes afterwards. You will hear her energy. Um, It's infectious and um, wonderful. Anna graduated from SCAD with a dual degree in graphic design and video studies. Uh, She was design supervisor at UPS for almost four years, where she worked on the brand's interactive work, including web design and online advertising. She has been a digital marketing manager at CM Digital an art director at Astral Brands, an e-commerce art director at Carter's, and for the last seven and a half years, she has been a mainstay at BBDO Atlanta. There, she helps to bring the agency's content creation vision to life, creating everything from point-of-sale work for the Georgia Lottery to digital campaigns for AT&T to trade show exhibits for Bayer. She's also worked on Embassy Suites, REI, Voya, and Zoo Atlanta. Now here it is, the first conversation since the pandemic began and since our country began to wake up from its sleepy complacency. I hope you enjoy. First off, thank you very much for taking time out of your day. I know that even given the situation, you guys are probably pretty busy, right? We are. We are. Like we've been, ever since the pandemic hit, honestly, we've been pretty busy because we have clients that have actually ramped up some Hmm. during this so it's it's yeah it's been a kind of nonstop thing <laughs> right now well that's good and bad i guess yeah. um so i there's a lot to talk about today um i haven't had a conversation with a professional in three months and um i really appreciate your being the first post sea change to be on this in, in fact right before we started talking <laughs> i sat here and i jotted down how do I refer? There's things you know how to refer to them. I know how to talk about COVID. So there's a pre-COVID and there's a pandemic. Mm-hmm. How do you talk about the other events? So I wrote them down. Is this? Do you mention the, the recent events as George Floyd, mm-hmm. cultural upheaval, the protests, national convulsions, the change, our evolution? The cultural evolution, I don't call it a cultural revolution, I call it the cultural evolution. Do we call it our collective awakening? Do we call it the necessary? So I'm trying to figure out how to refer to that period of time. Right. History will history will tell what this period of time is called, but I think you and I ought to make this our job as a creative team to name it right here on the podcast. So we'll figure that out before the end of it. <laughs> now I, I will say, like I like I certainly like some better 
than others. Um, so George Floyd, I feel like you want to give him his moment and then also kind of transition into what that bigger thing, because that's literally what happened, right? Like it was a moment that his life ended and then you had a chain reaction. Um, I, I like the word protest versus riot, which we've had some discussions about that um, at our company, um, just because it, it plays into this larger picture about media and how we're telling Black stories and stories in general around Black people about it not always being something that's negative or violent or um, concentrating on that part of it. It's a very, it's a very diminishing phrase. It is. It is. It diminishes the, uh, the action, the intent, and the, and the people involved by calling it riots. Um, so I, I, I call it the protest. I, I, like, I like the cultural evolution or the cultural upheaval, but we'll see where it lands. Um, because I think this is, a, this is a catalyst for a bigger conversation than, that will resonate, I think, hopefully, permanently through generations. But let's talk about you and your career, your work and everything first. And we'll, these things will weave their way in. When it was just COVID, when we had two months before the change, mm-hmm. <laughs> I'm going to work these in. Um, <laughs> how did you personally deal with isolation and how did the office run? How were you working? Um, I'm saying that because I know that I've I've had a lot of students struggling with even, even before this, how to collaborate, how to work, and how are you guys working and how are you handling uh, the new reality of, of the COVID situation? So I think um, it's always been pretty good for me. It was a little more difficult in the very beginning just because school was out and I have a six-year-old. So um, even though my husband was home as well, which was a big help, we were having to work in like, how do we do school? And then how does mom have work time and do conference calls? And, um, you know, like hopefully not have Donovan come in during certain conference calls. Um, what we found is that like as an agency, um, multiple people, you know, naturally have children, some don't. So there were, as long as it was agency calls with us, oh, yeah. there were quite a few people who did have their, ki- their kids, you know, running in yelling or, you know, talking, and it it became the new norm, which I'm very grateful for that no one, um, whether it was our CCO, CDs, no one was like, uh, your child. Um, So that was a huge help, but it was a little difficult making that transition from having work time, set work time, and then trying to do his schoolwork and all that stuff. But I think as an agency, it was actually easier to a certain degree because with Microsoft Teams, we were able to have meetings and I was able to share my screen immediately. Mm-hmm. And I'm the type of person where I don't get nervous or I'm not offended if someone is like quarterbacking <laughs> you know, behind me, like, hey, why don't we change this? And da, 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 da. Like if it gets the oh. project over the finish line. No, I, I, I can't stand that. I'm good, good, stand. For, good for you. But what about what about mentally? What about when it comes to like if you're working on a new brief and you're in your apartment or you're in your house or is it you know there's certain sort of visual triggers that like kind of help you like sort of get in that creative zone? It, was that harder for you to adjust to being in, in in the house working on new collaborating or working on new ideas or was that that didn't get in your way at all? I mean you're a senior level person and probably at this yeah. point that's not a problem for you. It didn't, it didn't get in my way. Um, again, it was just a time thing. I work better at night. Um, so when it's quiet, I ought to be young. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like the best thoughts, the ideas usually start coming around 2 a.m. still for me. Um, wow. And so that was, that was cool. But I think also, um, so like I have a really good partner and because we already had like a good relationship or partnership pre COVID, mm-hmm. um, it translated well post COVID basically. Yeah. That makes, that makes sense. That makes sense. Yeah. Uh, all right. So 
I do want to talk a little bit about um, the elephant in the room and the thing that's happening that we can't escape. And I want to, I, and I'm going to ask you questions, and and I want the listeners to to be aware that I know that I probably will ask stupid questions, and I know that I probably will make some missteps, and I pr- know that I will probably sound stupid at times. But there's certain things that I just want to understand the mindset when you're approaching things, and we all carry our own hangups and our own identity issues. We have issues with uh, how we look, where we come from, and all those kind of things. Are you and have you throughout your career been acutely aware when you walk into a room that you're black? Do you carry that with you in in meetings? Do you do you, Are you sensitive to feedback through that filter? Talk a little bit about what it's like to be a black person working in what has historically been a very white industry. Um, so to answer the first question, yes, I'm always aware that I am um, the black person in the room. Oftentimes I'm the only one. And I think it's it's not uh, it's something one inescapable. I look different <laughs> than everyone else that's in this room. Um, but I think that a couple of things that I've always tried to do is, is in, I think sometimes it's not fair to have to do it, but it's a reality, which is to make people comfortable around you. Um, so that goes to sometimes, uh, uh, certainly pre COVID, it might be actually shaking someone's hand or there's something that happens with physical contact in disarming people who don't look like you. Um, so sometimes it's you know carried out in that way. Other times it might just be um, cracking a joke. I never crack. I used to have a, um, a CD who um, was not black, but was not um, uh, white either. And he would sometimes crack jokes that were demeaning to people who look like him. Right. And Self, self-deprecating to try to yeah, disarm. Yeah. yeah. And I, I found that like, that's certainly not, not the route really that no. I take. Um, no. I don't think that that's necessary, but I do think that you typically, when you are the only one in the room, um, you almost carry this thing on you, this burden to a certain degree of like having other people feel comfortable with you. Um, God, it's, <laughs> I, had, I had the word queued up. I was going to ask you if you felt the burden of it. And um, wow. You do. And sometimes it's heavier than others. Um, but that all depends on who's in the room with you. And if you have, which we're seeing right now, you have genuine allies in the room. It makes a difference. Right, because they um, they shoulder some of that burden with you. Like mm-hmm. they take it on as like, hey, you, sh- I'm comfortable with this person. You should be comfortable with this person as well. Yeah, um, the only my only analogy to that would be there's been moments in a class or in any social situation when someone says something that's that's clearly sexist. Mm-hmm. And let's say maybe there's only one or two women, and then the guy that says the sexist thing or another guy will look at the woman to see if she's offended. It's like, you know what? <laughs> she's not the only one capable of being offended by that comment. Right. And I will almost always step up and say, dude, come on. Like, I mean, like, and, and maybe she's not comfortable defending that. Maybe she's not comfortable speaking up and maybe not everybody feels like they're willing to take that burden walking into a room as the only person who's quote unquote different. So, um, you know, it's funny cause I had heard fr- about you from more than one person <laughs> that Uh-oh. you're like wait put your seatbelt on that that, that <laughs> anna anna is is a is a leader beyond her years and outspoken and i think that i would almost ask you just as a creative director if i'm talking to you as a creative director and a senior person what advice would you give to a young creative who's not comfortable shouldering that burden who's not comfortable feeling like they want to they resent that they need to shake people's hands they resent that they need to be uh, take the position of disarming the fucking white people starting, sorry, that that's their job to do that. Like, what would you tell that person? So I think the first thing I always tell, um, young black creatives, um, is that 
one be un unequivocally and unapologetically you. So whether that is rocking your natural hair or that is, um, I wear my daishiki to work. Like <laughs> I yep. have absolutely no problem with that. Like, I think that's the first thing. And I think it's super important in creative, in a creative atmosphere, because when you're hiding a part of you, you're not doing your best work. Well, like, the term, the term for that is masking. And I think something yeah. like 80, 80%, 60 to 80% of, of black people in corporate America mask, they conform and they hide their true identity. It's very, very common with LGBTQ and many minorities. And it's, uh, it's something we all need to work towards eliminating, especially you hit the nail on the head in the situation where you're being hired for who you are and what you are. Right. That's your role there is to bring your voice. It is. It's not to mask your voice or conform to another voice. Plus it's stifling to your own personal process. It is. And I feel like for a lot of um, black creatives, you want to get your foot in the door naturally. And I tell people though, it's okay to leave. <laughs> like if you feel like you're say, for instance, in a place where you have to mask constantly, it's okay. It's okay to, to move on to someplace else where that is not going to always be the case. Um, I would also say to young black creatives is that, that, that burden that you may feel is an unfortunate reality when we're stepping into spaces that are predominantly white. Um, but it doesn't have to be something that's exhausting for you. And it, it, it shouldn't be, it's a reality. And it's a reality that truthfully, I, I feel like for most black people, we don't have to tell each other that. We already know, like we were, um, the BBDO New York piece, the talk is one of my favorite pieces ever, um, just because we we already have those conversations. Like when we're young, our parents are telling us, you're different, you know you're different. These are the realities that you're going to have to deal with. Now where we are in a moment of time right now is that it's time to shift those realities. And it's always been a reality for us, but now it's different because it's a reality for you like white people True. are starting to be like, hey, that's the reality you guys always had? Hold up, that's not cool. And now those conversations are shifting. So that burden that I mentioned before is not just shouldered by just me and other young black creatives. It's shouldered by other white people who are saying yeah. it's not cool. Yeah, here's here's the thing that I, I don't know if I've ever talked about this, but I think it's really important. I think that the other side of the coin is is that we, the population of people who have benefited from white privilege need to give some very heavy thought to what that means, what you've been given, what you don't have to acknowledge, what you don't have to do. And the white privilege doesn't mean that you're <sighs> threatened by this, but rather that you have a role in this, the way you perceive things. So I don't have to have gone through what you went through. I went through what I went through. What I went through was never having to face it. So I was robbed of empathy. I was robbed of reality in a lot of ways. So I think that 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 white people need to, is, is <laughs> to understand how they fit in that process to best sort of meet halfway. I don't I don't know if that what I'm saying makes sense, but I think that it's it's not a matter of necessarily feeling sympathy. Mm -hmm. It's a matter of empathizing based on where you're coming from. Um, I I like that. And I, I like one thing I've told to like a lot of my uh, white coworkers, friends, et cetera, is that one, um, I think, especially right after um, George Floyd's death, and we started to see the, the protests that a lot of um, my white friends and colleagues didn't know what to say. So they didn't say anything. Mm -hmm. um, and once we all got on the call and, you know, really start to talk about this thing and it was like, okay, it's okay to not know what to say. It's okay. The thing is to not sit in any place of guilt and have that immobilize you where you're not progressing the overall society. So like you see what's happening, you feel bad. That's great. Um, 
then it's like, what can you do to help? And I think that there are some concrete steps for sure. The white privilege that you speak of, I think is um, one, certainly something to examine, but it's almost, I want people to kind of look at those microaggressions that aren't necessarily under this category of um, racist or um, they're not overt. And sometimes when we think of white privilege, we might just be thinking of the more overt, overt um, things that we would put under white privilege. Yes, see, I, I think, think the way I define white privilege is that I don't ever have to concern myself when I am in a red light and a cop pulls up next to me. It just does not cross my mind. Right. That white privilege is having to never think about that. The white privilege is having to never had a talk with my 15 year old son about how to talk to a police officer. I've never had to, never had to. That's that's what I how I define white privileges. Is it's a lack of the of similar experience. It's not something plus. It's just a lack of that part of it. I don't know. If that makes sense. I agree with that. Yeah. What's the so? What have you told um, young Donovan about current events? So, it's been a combination of one. You know, naturally, my husband and I are watching uh, the news. So his question was around um, like what's happening? Why are people out with signs? Um, and we ourselves have been out um, with signs. So I think the first thing we do is he's very aware that he's a little brown boy. Um, and we've always surrounded him with literature and et cetera that celebrates that brownness. Um, and so what we told him is, again, he's six. So it was more around someone is no longer here anymore because he's brown. Mm. And then his question becomes, it's, it's very, it's interesting and it's difficult at the same time because he's at this age still where he thinks police just go after the bad people, right? So if you're taught, you know, naturally when we're young, we're initially taught like, hey, police only go after bad people. So then that's initially, you know, what you're taught in school. Um, and then, but that other layer for little black children is that no, police don't always go after bad people. They go after people who are brown because of their own issues. Um, and so that was the conversation we kind of had to have for, with him for the first time of like police and others um, hurt brown people because of racism. We had to use the word racism. Yeah. Um, and that is a behavior where because you are different, because you look different, because you are brown, that you are devalued and devalued isn't the word we use, but the word is that people think less about your life. It's so profoundly upsetting because when I was his age up until probably, you know, teen years, I grew up being educated as a Jewish person. So mm -hmm. you learned about the Holocaust and you learned that people were gassed, 6 million people were gassed to death or worse uh, because they were Jewish, which is, to me, relatively as ar it's as arbitrary as race. That was always, we were always educated to believe that that was from some acute, isolated evil from the Nazi Germany. Mm -hmm. And that uh, there are people in my grandparents' generation that will never trust a person with a German accent, but it was isolated there. It must be so much more unsettling to say, these are the police officers in your community. And you can't identify police as evil. You can't identify it fellow Americans as evil. It was so convenient for us Jews to just say, oh, it was the Nazis that were evil. Mm -hmm. That something that was, that it, was a, it was a psychosis or it was a mental illness or something that, that Hitler had or something. You could write it off. It wasn't permanent. It is permanent actually. It's still happening now um, with the current administration um, incidences of incidents of anti-Semitism are on the rise like they've never been. Right. Um, but it's almost easy because these are, these aren't the uniformed officers that, were, that are entrusted to take care of us. 
Very true. Very true. I think that, um, man, that just made me more sad. Um, I'm fucking sad. Yeah, I know. Um, <laughs> it, it, it did because there, it does just bring to life um, the difficulty of, it's, it's difficulty, but it's also anger, to be honest, Dan. Like, um, sometimes I get angry that one, I have to explain this to my child, um, and two, that my child has to go through it. Um, yeah. And that you can never, per, like, as much as you try to prepare, like, hey, we, you know, we've been doing this, like, hey, do this, do this, do this, and hopefully the police will let you come back home to me. Um, and then you realize that that like means absolutely nothing because they still might not come home. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. All right, we can switch gears. Sure. Um, it's kind of related, I guess. Okay. So, so I looked at your work. <clears throat> I looked at your work. Um, the uh, the Gracie, the fight against sex trafficking piece is amazing. So that piece won um, a gold can lion. Uh, it won an award at Ameri American Advertising Awards, um, one show, DNAD. <clears throat> the, that piece and the Georgia Lottery work um, makes social statements. And it seems like you're doing a lot more than selling potato chips or lottery tickets. And the Hope Scholarship spots really resonated with me. The, the ability to affect change was the subject of the, su of the subject of the spot. And it was all about having a platform and talking about, we talk about that with students. We talk about the fact that when you graduate, you're going to go off, you're going to have a platform. Is that real? Do you feel that you have uh, the ability to affect change in your role as a art director at BBDO? And do you approach m m a lot of your briefs with that responsibility as a professional? I think definitely. Um, I had that innate sense and have always had that idea that like somehow some way I got to be able to change the world um and it sounds sometimes it does sound lofty but um I do I think just inherently look for those opportunities when I do get a brief um but I think that the first thing when I get a brief is just how how do I articulate or how do I rework, reimagine what you know they're trying to express in this beautiful, digestible uh, way. And I think it's kind of the same way with how you um, use your platform in some kind of way. Like how do I get this message across in the, you know, the most dynamic way that I possibly can. And I do feel that um, typically with any, any project, there's a place for that, especially now, not just in the wake of, you know, cultural, was the cultural awakening. How about that? Was that okay, one? Yeah, yeah uh, I like that. That even before that you had so many brands that are sh making that shift, right? Like, especially, so before, let's say maybe 10 years ago, um, brands were saying like, hey, just buy my product. But we've had this huge shift where it's okay for brands. Like, it's not even just okay, like it's expected now of brands to say, this is my stance on mm -hmm. social issues. So I feel like now we are given, as creatives, we are given this this greater license. That's cool. To use a platform. Use it That's as cool. a platform. That's cool. And it's not always huge social issues. I mean, it's, there's just, your work has some like really sweet humanity in it. And there's a spot for Lay's that just has such a human moment in it um, with the dad and the daughter in the car. Um, that spot, by the way, has five words in it. Like, who needs copywriters, <laughs> right? Um, it's really, it was really sweet. It reminded me a little bit of that great Hershey's commercial. I don't know if you saw it. I don't even know what agency did it. Where the guy uh, can't 
be with his daughter. She, she wants to make s'mores or something. And he keeps saying he has a meeting. So then he makes a cardboard cutout, puts mm -hmm. it in front of a meeting and then goes with her into the kitchen and makes s'mores with her. It's really sweet. Oh. oh no, he doesn't make it. I got it wrong. She went and built it. She went to the, it shows her go to the hardware store. It shows her uh, at a print place where she blew up a big picture of him. And she put together mm -hmm. this like flat mannequin and gave it to him so that he would be with her. It's really sweet. Oh yeah. Really, really sweet. Yeah. Um, that's one of my favorite spots. It's one of my, like, like you said, five words. I know five words <laughs> but, um, that it it's, it's a beautiful moment. And um, it's also like one of those great processes that, you know, finding that person, finding those, those right people who can have those facial expressions. Oh, she was amazing. Yeah. yeah so that was so listeners, there's a link uh, uh, on the Facebook page to, um, to Anna's website, you can see all that stuff on Anna's website. Um, so I want to ask a little bit about the the lotto stuff. For um, those were sort of short; they were like three to four minute films, I think. For um, for for a lot for Georgia Lottery, um, is that stuff advertising branded content? Where do they exist? How do they live? It's <laughs> a good question, Dan. <laughs> um, so it was it was billed as um, branded content, basically branded. Mm -hmm content for Georgia Lottery. Um, and it's, it's such an interesting story because Georgia Lottery, you know, all the spots are usually funny. Yes. Right? They're, they're all funny spots. Um, so this was the first time where we, we were able to say like, hey, the Hope Scholarship, um, which like to your previous question, maybe sometimes I'm searching for the, the lofty change the world stuff too much. Um, but maybe not. That's just my personality. Uh, but for those spots, they were billed as, uh, like I said, branded content, in particular around the Hope Scholarship, which it just kind of made sense, right? Like you're talking about the Hope Scholarship and how many lives it's changed, but not only the lives that it changed, but like it's exponential because those people then go on and do X, Y, Z things, you know, and then of course, a lot of them do it still here in Georgia. So that's why you play the lottery, right? Like that's how the lottery was sold to us. Right, exactly. <laughs> yeah, You're gonna cool. help educate Georgians. Um, and that's what it did. And so like, yeah, those little documentaries were um, three minute pieces and we sold them as like, hey, this is a way to tell that story. Um, that's not a 30 second spot, but can be trimmed down at some point if you want to. Oh, good luck with that. Good luck. <laughs> <laughs> that's like that's like the puzzle that no one ever tells you about in school. <clears throat> it's how to trim get your trim down. Yeah. You gotta make this into a 15. It's like yeah. you can see and you can see spots. It's like I'm so I'm so like I don't know, saturated with advertising brain that like you can watch commercials on TV and say, oh, that would have worked better if they hadn't had to cut it. Because you, a lot of times I'll, I watch sports, so I'll see like the original 60 second spot. And then like a few weeks later, I'll see it cut down. I'm like, oh, they cut out the best joke. They cut out the best <laughs> joke. Uh, oh, well. <clears throat> it's like, no, don't cut Oh my God. I've never told this story on the podcast. So I was, I, I have a friend who worked at SNL. So I was an extra on Saturday Night Live when I lived in New York, which is really right. fun. But I also got to go to a live show and I got to go to a rehearsal show. This has nothing to do with what we're talking about or advertising. Um, so I went to a rehearsal show and it was way back. This will date me because this is back when we were in New York was still during, um, it's right after the OJ Simpson trial. So the opening sketch, the opening sketch was uh, a trial uh, like O.J. Simpson trial. I think Tim Meadows was the actor playing an attorney. And they call the first sketch the cold open. So it's like the very first thing you see. And then there's a joke that goes straight to live from New York at Saturday Night Live. It's Saturday night. So in the rehearsal, the last joke of that sketch was hilarious. It was super funny and he nailed it. The crowd went crazy and it was live from New York at Saturday night. On the live show, he botched the punchline. Oh. Like he told it backwards. Yeah. And nobody knew. Everybody in the country was like, that was dumb. That was a stupid joke. Oh. Like sometimes you know too much. <laughs> but like, you know what else? I think the, the ultimate lesson of that is cut some people some slack. You know, people yeah. are trying the best they can. Um, <laughs> so, which is my answer to the next question. I have two. 
final question, not actually the last, okay, fine, I'll do it in this order. My okay. next question, knowing what you know now, if you could go back in time to the day you started your career, and I don't have your resume in front of me like a like an idiot, but where, where was your first job as an art director or designer? It was. So um, it was, I think the first part of my career was certainly more he design heavy and it was, was UPS, their corporate. Oh. Okay. So <laughs> graduating from SCAD and going to UPS, what, what would you whisper in young Anna's ear? Um, I would say that um, bring your authentic self. So we kind of talked about this earlier. I didn't know that early on. Like I would say for the first um, five years for sure of my career, I was so focused on making sure that I was professional and um, that- They're not uh, mutually exclusive though. You didn't know that. No, no. You didn't know that. And I thought that, um, you know, like we're talking about hair and stuff, which is, you know, for black women, there are the spectrum of uh, how we deal with our hair. And when I was younger, for sure, it was always straight because typically that is um, easily, I, I feel like it's more accepted. It's typically more accepted by white people, honestly. Um, and I, I feel like my overall demeanor was more subdued and um, not that I'm a very loud person or anything like that, but just I was I was quietly moving about, working hard, making sure not to ruffle any feathers or anything like that. And um, I feel like I would tell younger me like, girl, do you like, yeah. <laughs> like don't don't feel like you have to quiet yourself um, to make other people comfortable. Like you can still be you and people be comfortable with the you that they're seeing. I'm clapping, I'm clapping into the camera for that. Uh, that's awesome. Uh, that's that's great. I think part of that is being young um, and it's good universal advice. Um, and then the other question, my final question, which I typically ask earlier, but I typed it in the wrong order, is what personal trait of yours, what do you think it is about Anna Taylor? What is it about you that's been sort of your most valuable trait? Passion. Passion. Giving, a sh giving a shit? Yeah, like passion about the um, world changing ideas, but also passion about... I've been passionate about a deck before, like, <laughs> um, and I feel like everyone around me feels that passion, um, that desire to kind of really make, even if I'm just making information um, beautiful and um, like enticing, that I'm passionate about that. Like I, I really give a damn about that as much as I give a damn about stopping sex trafficking. Yeah, uh, that's that's what makes it that's what makes a great professional art director or copywriter. Like you care about those little things. That's really cool. That's yeah. really cool. It makes a difference, I think. That's awesome. Thank you so much for talking with me. Well thank you for having me. I hope uh, I answered everything. <laughs> you know what? Well you know what the beauty of this podcast is? We'll oh. never know. We'll never know. <laughs> um, <laughs> like, oh my gosh, Anna, what were you thinking? No, you were you're awesome. So listeners, um, Anna has asked if you have a second to go with uh, go to standwithbree.com, um, make a donation there, um, get involved. Uh, is standwithbre.com. I'll put a link on the Facebook page. I'm trying to figure out another format because most people aren't seeing the Facebook page, but whatever. Um, and uh, you can always reach me as always at Dan's Podcast at mac.com with questions, comments. Um, I'm also on LinkedIn, Twitter. Uh, the um, podcast is on Spotify it's all over the place you can find it you already found it so here it is um, thanks again so much I, Anna I really appreciate you you and I I feel like this conversation we're Lewis and Clark we're headed out to the to the west as the, as the pioneers try to figure out how to do these conversations in the post-COVID uh, post-collective awakening and uh, I really appreciate your 
stra strapping on a backpack and coming with me for this one. I really appreciate it very much. Well, thank you for having me. It's um, difficult conversations, but we got to we got to start doing it. We got to start really doing it. Thank you so much. Thank All you. right, listeners, we'll see you again soon. Bye.